Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. What lessons have we learned from these early months of Donald Trump's presidency? Will we continue to view presidential elections primarily as entertainment and around-the-clock reality show? Or are the protests and organizing efforts signs that we are taking politics more seriously, that we're more willing to become civically engaged? Is there a danger that younger people might think this kind of haphazard, chaotic, and often ill-informed presidency is normal? We'll talk about all of this with my guest, Christina Greer, an associate professor of political science at Fordham University and author of the book, Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the American Dream. Christina, welcome. Thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me. I'd like to start by taking a look at what's going on in the, in the classroom. I mean, you have uh, quite a mix of students um, at Fordham um, in terms of their um, political outlook, um, their ethnic and religious background, their economic background, and, and that sort of thing. Geographic diversity Geographic well. diversity, mm -hmm. yep. Um, what has that meant in terms of the reaction inside your classrooms to the Trump presidency? Well, it's multifold in the sense that there's some students who are coming to the table with almost no political background at all. So the introductory classes that I teach are literally the first time that they're introduced to the role of the presidency, uh, the founding fathers, uh, the veto power, executive orders, the interactions between you know Congress and the courts and separation of powers and Federal 51. All these things are brand new to them. Then there are others who, you know, have sort of paid attention. They read the news here or there. They watch The Daily Show. And then there are some that are really entrenched either in the local politics of their home state or, you know, are, are just incredibly involved and they read the news all the time. So I'm teaching to many layers and levels in one classroom and very diverse opinions. I just keep telling my students, though, this is not normal. <laughs> you know, I mean, this presidency in right. so many ways goes against so many theories that I've been able to just kind of teach, you know, almost on autopilot. What is sort of comforting for students that are very frightened and very concerned about the lack of intellect, experience, knowledge of this particular, not just the president, but his entire administration, what I've told them and what I'm telling myself <laughs> oftentimes is that if you read the Constitution and if you understand what the the framers had in mind when they were building the Constitution as a living breathable document they planned for this very scenario they planned for a person like Donald Trump they planned for you know I don't know if they planned for Congress to sort of acquiesce the way they have in so many ways but there are a lot of I would like to argue and hopefully I'm correct trap doors in the Constitution to protect us from an overreach of a Donald Trump mm -hmm. now if he goes nuclear with Kim Jong-un, there's nothing in the Constitution <laughs> that can protect us, right? We're dealing with two insecure men who are both trigger happy. That, there's nothing in the Constitution for. But as far as really thinking about, you know, when you think about, say, the Muslim ban and the Muslim ban 2.0, this is the courts stepping in when they right. should, right? This is also, when we think about Gorsuch being nominated, this is Congress behaving badly, changing the rules in the middle of the stream. That is not what the framers intended, but there's still ways that we can sort of circumvent that, right? So I have to just, at this moment in time, trust and believe that there are enough measures and counteracting forces that the framers hopefully foresaw <laughs> that will protect us right. in this moment, especially what feels like a moment of overreach and incompetence. How do most of your students get their news? Um, I tell them, honestly, I don't care what they're reading as long as they're reading something because news leads them to other news. A lot of them watch the night shows. Um, a lot of them watch the cable shows. Uh, a lot of them are on Facebook and Twitter, and that's where they get the bulk of their news as well. 
Um, and so just encouraging them to actually read the articles and not just click and link um, and sort of thumbs up something without fully reading it um, just for the title. One of the reasons I asked is because, um, one, I'm really concerned about this idea that um, we're, um, so many of our public figures are getting out of touch with mm -hmm. ideas, <laughs> with things like facts and the mm -hmm. truth and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. You can start with the president, but it's not just the president. There are other politicians and also aspects of the media. And I just assumed that it must be difficult for young people to, to sort of navigate all the information that, that's around. Well, now we're having philosophical conversations about what is truth, you know, right. what is reality. And if you don't disagree with it, all of a sudden is it untrue? I mean, you know, I also need to make very clear to them, it's not just the president. I mean, he's supported by an entire administration that is co-signing some of this bad behavior and, and this inability to deal with facts, right? And so I mean, when you have a press secretary who is literally making up facts on the fly, that is very confusing, especially for someone mm -hmm. who's just now being introduced to politics. So I mean, it's a really intricate balance because I want to point out what is and this what I think is unfortunately a nadir in our political history, but also get them excited about possibly running for office. It doesn't have to be mayor, it could be right. school board or county Absolutely. board or community board. So how do I introduce them to, unfortunately, some of the underbelly of politics that, we're, that we have experienced and we definitely are experiencing right now, but also not making them jaded so they want to just walk away from it? completely. So explaining the importance of protest politics yeah. and also electoral politics. The youngsters who are concerned about what's going on, what are, the, what are the things that bother them most? Well, I mean, a lot of them are really concerned about international affairs. Right. I mean, you know, when, when they, see, they see the visuals, they're a very visual generation as well. When you think about sort of Instagram and the yep. ways that they communicate with one another. So these pictures are incredibly powerful to them. Not to mention that there are videos of everything now. That exactly. Nothing like when I was coming along. No way. And, and regular people in Syria or yeah. insert name of country, you know, they, they become journalists in a lot of ways and they upload something to Facebook and it gets spread to millions of people within minutes. So I think international politics definitely concern them. Um, you know, I'm trying to get them a lot more interested in local politics. I mean, a lot of students, you know, right. aren't registered in New York. They aren't planning on voting in the mayoral election in New York City this year. They don't know who the city council member is who right. represents their district, you know, at Fordham or if they live in one of the five boroughs. So, you know, I'm trying to get them to understand that although federal politics is incredibly important and the role of the president, as we've seen, can be exhausting, but it is incredibly important as well, we cannot ignore state houses, we can't ignore city council members, we can't ignore the mayor and the governor and all of the other electoral positions in between. I think that's such an important point. I've been um, uh, talking to people about the fact that uh, liberal and progressive voters especially mm -hmm. have this tendency of turning out in big numbers in presidential elections and then two years later in the off-year elections, uh, congressional elections, state and local mm -hmm. elections, you know, the sort of the, the voting rolls fall off a cliff, right. uh, which is how the Republicans have managed to get control of both houses of Congress right. and, of course, now the, now the, the White House. But, um, well, I think it's because oftentimes people think that it's an off year, meaning they can take exactly. off. Exactly. You know, and, and especially for Democrats and especially for people of color, where we see that, you know, when people of color stay home, that's all the difference in the world between having a Republican governor versus a, a Democratic governor in, or, or a state house right. or, or whatever it may be. And the implications can be profound. I mean, uh, Merrick Garland never exactly. was... Uh, never made it to the mm -hmm. Supreme Court, and, mm -hmm. and it's because of the control of state houses mm -hmm. and governorships that Republicans have been so successful with gerrymandering and that sort of thing. So now there are um, there is a, a tremendous amount of pushback against the Trump presidency, and there's a lot of organizing uh, at the local level and, and that sort of thing. But do you think that that can be sustained, and, and, and do you think that that effort can be translated into getting more people to the polls? Next year uh, is almost on top of us, right. and that's another important off-year election. Right. I think some of these special elections across the country might be interesting test cases. I'm obviously thinking about the Georgia right. election with you know, a young 30-year-old upstart who's you know, <laughs> giving a Republican a run yeah. for her money. So I think we have some test cases that we should pay attention to. I mean, you know, whether or not the protests keep up, you know, really depends on just how much of a smash and grab this administration will be. 
You know, I mean, they're deflecting from Russia. That's actually really not a tangible issue for a lot of people because it's not a pocketbook issue, you know? So it's, it sounds a little bit like he say, she say, because even though there are sort of what, what I may argue are pretty clear cut facts, when Republicans are saying, no, that didn't happen. I didn't talk to the person, even though we know that they did. It, it turns into a, a circular argument of he say, she say. Right. So that's not really holding people in a lot of ways. Now, if Trump keeps promising jobs and he, del he delivers 12 coal jobs like he did, you know, last <laughs> month, right. that actually, you know, it depends on how, how strongly some of these deeply entrenched Trump voters want to hold on to their whiteness versus their economic interest. I mean, some of them, you know, even with the health care debate, they're still giving him the grade of an A, even though, you know, right. reporters were very clear. It's like, but you do know this particular policy would take everything, the little bit that you have would be taken away from you. Like, it's still better than Obama. You know, and so it's, they can't see anything except for the fact that they want him to be successful because they genuinely do think that he's on their side. You touched on this, and I mentioned it in the, in the opening. You, you talk about some of the shortcomings of the president, and, and you mentioned even other people in the administration, but um, a lack of understanding of policy, for example, which actually was shown in the, in the discussions over health care. Mm -hmm. There were Republicans in Congress who were appalled mm -hmm. at the president's lack of knowledge of the details of the plan that he, mm -hmm. that he was pushing. Um, but that's not surprising with this president. And then there were the personal failings that we saw all through the campaign. None of this is, is a secret. My question is, how different do you think the reaction would have been from other politicians, uh, the media, and I suppose public at large, if Hillary Clinton or a Barack Obama had similar shortcomings? Oh, Bob, I mean, the mental gymnastics that so many of these, and I'm going to say white voters, have allowed themselves to have in the passes that they keep giving this particular man are almost, in the true sense of the word, incredible, right? I mean, right. think of it this way. I always tell people, it's like, imagine if Barack Obama had five different children by three different women, was thrice married. <laughs> right. We wouldn't know who he We would who, never have heard I, of him. I keep saying, it's like he'd be Barry the dude from the South Side of Chicago, right? right. He wouldn't even be a state senator. Right. If Hillary Clinton had five children by three different men, we would never know. I mean, she would be every name in the book. I mean, think of it this way. So many Americans didn't even know that Donald Trump had a 10-year-old son. Right. A woman doesn't many. have that luxury, yeah. right? So it's yeah. like because, and if she did have a 10-year-old son, at that age, I mean, the conversation, so we can even start with the, the basics, right? What if Michelle Obama decided to live in Chicago and we all had to pay hundreds of millions of dollars on a monthly basis to keep her? In a in tower of gold. In Chicago rather than in, a tower in, of gold. in Washington Please. with the president. I right? mean, we haven't even touched on policy yet. Now, this <laughs> is, you know, this is, people say what you will about Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Those are probably two of the smartest presidents and presidential nominees we've ever seen, right? They read. They enjoy reading. They enjoy the intellectual tangling with other right. smart people at the table. And they They're both have bullies. a deep grasp of, of politics of and government. Politics, yeah. policy, but also it's not just a grasp, it's a respect for it, mm -hmm. right? And so even though Obama was very inexperienced when he came into the he White was. House, right? Yep. Only a few years in the state Senate, a year and change in the Senate, right? <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, that was incredible. Yeah, it's like, what itself. happened? Right. Like, yeah. Barack Hussein Obama's president. He's, he got to D.C. 20 minutes ago. Well, I didn't but, think Obama was going to become president, and I right. didn't think Trump was going to become president, and so I need to are. stop predicting. Right, <laughs> let's, let's. But, but the thing is, I think the, the fundamental difference is Obama has a deep respect for the Constitution. He's actually read it. He's actually tussled with some of our sharpest intellectual minds across the country about what it means for governance for a balance of power, right? He doesn't have the hubris where he walked into the Oval Office and said, Kim Jong-un, yeah, he shouldn't be in power. Let's actually start interacting with him. Well, he was After, actually a constitutional scholar. Yeah. Uh, so, Obama was. And Kim, Kim Jong-un, you know, we haven't really interacted with North Korea since 1953 because we know that, that is a losing war on, on so many fronts, right? We could actually lose the planet. So this is a man in Donald Trump who... I, I just made a wager with a colleague of mine. I don't think he's read the Constitution since he got elected. <laughs> you win that wager. I, hands, like, down. hands down. I don't think he's read it. We can tell that he doesn't really respect the will of law, but you can't respect something that you don't have any grasp of, right? And so 
he's not able to really get these factions under control. You know, after the health care bill failed, he literally said, you know, well, we've got these things called factions. It's like, yes, dear. We've all known that because <laughs> he said anyone, it actually was complicated. Yeah, he's fixing like, healthcare in the United who States. Who knew? It's like we all knew. <laughs> actually, I did. I raised my hand. Right. So it's like, had you read Federalist Ten in the time period before coming to Washington D.C., you could you could actually be prepared. But he's never prepared because he just he goes on feeling. He's you know when someone says he's that grandpa who golfs all day, watches TV, and then yells at the TV, and then goes back to nap and goes back to golfing. That's what we're dealing with right now. The difference is it's not someone's retired grandpa in Florida. It's the leader of the free world. And I think that um, it's important not to let the Republican Party off the hook. One, it's all. the Republican Party policies and tactics and strategies over many years that led to the moment that Donald Trump could become elected uh, president. And the fact that they control both houses of Congress are in, uh, is enabling him um, and they still enable him. Now, exa exactly right. There should be a check, as you've been pointing out. Congress should be a check on the White House when the president mm -hmm. is as unprepared mm -hmm. as Donald Trump is. But I think because he's such, because Trump is such a bully, I think so many Republican members of Congress are so fearful of the moment that we're in right now, this frenzy, it seems, right. and also the abysmal turnout in primaries. And they all, keep in mind, a lot of them remember 2010 when they those do, Tea right. Party years came in and took out some of their longstanding yep. colleagues. So they're very worried that a Donald Trump can come in, stir up that type of excitement or animus or whichever direction it's in, depending on the district, and they will lose their jobs. So in order to keep him happy, they essentially will put the entire country at risk for their own job security with someone that they have to know is not capable of doing the job. So you and I had discussed before the program um, the fact that you use um, an interview that Jesse Jackson had given many years ago, half, almost half a century ago, actually, to Playboy magazine. <laughs> yes. And Jesse Jackson is an example, I think, of someone who's very talented, public figure, was on the scene, obviously, for many years, um, but also a, a very flawed um, figure. But you use this interview in your classes. Tell, tell us why. Well, you know, <laughs> of course I have to preface it, where it's like, <laughs> we're about to read a Playboy interview. You know, it's like, but Playboy is known well, for these great articles. You know, because the joke is always, you know, Playboy is known for its articles. It's like, no, it actually had... In many cases, that's Fantastic. True, yeah. So this is a 1969 article, right after, shortly after Martin Luther King Jr. has been assassinated. Jesse Jackson is possibly in a position to become the heir apparent of the civil rights movement. And he gives this quite long, lengthy interview with Playboy about just kind of the state of black America, the state of America, race relations. I mean, I think that his racial analysis is spot on, but what I was fascinated with was definitely his class analysis about poor whites essentially trading in their financial reality for a perceived elevated white status. Um, I think if we look at this this article, there's a direct line to some of the strategies that he had in 84 and especially 88 when he ran for the presidency of thinking about all 50 states and not ignoring, you know, poor whites right. that actually could be susceptible to a, a big D Democratic message, sort of the conversation we're having before, the Democrats constantly want to run away from Lyndon Johnson and some of the work on poverty and immigration and right. civil rights and voting rights that he was actually putting together. Jesse Jackson was saying, it's like, these issues are, in many ways, poor people issues, right? And so if we can really think about the Rainbow Coalition um, and the real necessities of a lot of Americans, there is, there's fodder there. So this was a, an, a piece where, you know, this is before we have the, the usherance of, you know, sort of the largest black class of, you know, black members of Congress and the CBC with, say, Charlie Rangel and, you know, all right. those folks coming in. This is 69. They're not even there yet. So I, I just thought it was a fascinating, a fascinating article um, where I really, I thought that his analysis of America in that moment in time where there was so mm -hmm. much anguish, right, because there had been rebellions across major cities, King's been assassinated, you know, Malcolm's been assassinated, Kennedy's been assassinated, the other Kennedy's been assassinated. So it was just the 60s were a very turbulent time. So this 1969 article really does in many ways 
feel like the door of a decade closing and Jackson kind of presenting himself in the doorway as a possibility. Right. A possibility for what, we're not sure, but a possibility nonetheless. One of the things I remember um, from that time is the fact that the Democratic Party, you mentioned um, uh, Lyndon Johnson, he had um, just left office in, in uh, 1969, at the beginning of 1969. But Lyndon Johnson and the Kennedys and many of the big names from the 1960s represented a Democratic Party mm -hmm. that would fight you tooth and nail for the, is for the issues that the party um, believed in, sometimes for, for, for better or for worse, if mm -hmm. you look at the southern wing of the Democratic, uh, <laughs> right. Democratic Party. But nevertheless, the Democratic Party, there was nothing faint-hearted about it. It has seemed to me that in recent decades that the Republican Party is willing to fight much harder for the things that it wants, I don't know about, but the things that it wants mm -hmm. than the Democratic Party. Do you agree with that? It, 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 uh, an example would be what they did with Merrick Garland. Mm -hmm. um, they basically declared at the beginning of the Obama administration that they wanted that administration to fail. Mm -hmm. The gerrymandering that, mm -hmm. I, that I mentioned. Do you think that they fight harder? And if you do, why do you think so? I think that the Republicans have been on a two decades long march on the offense. I think that their strategy has been so much better than the Democrats in the sense that the Democrats have been focusing on national politics while the Republicans have slowly but surely started taking state houses right. left and right. 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 The Democrats have some mayors and that's about it, right? I mean, as of today, right. the Democrats don't have anything in Washington, D.C., not even the courts, and some mayors. Yeah, the and Republicans have, have even been more serious about yeah. uh, federal, federal judgeships and, and that and sort of thing, blocking, not just at and, the Supreme yeah, Court. And even blocking Obama's, you know, he had so many judgeships open yep. for so much of his, his tenure. And I think Democrats took an eight-year lap congratulating themselves on the back for electing a black man while they lost s seats across the country in all 50 states. In law, and, and, and lost both houses of Congress. Yeah, both. And so, I mean, you know, and part of that is Obama, part of that's the DNC, part of that's the larger Democratic Party, part of that's the shift in the lack of articulating the real vision, part of that's the internal civil war that the Democratic Party has right now, whether or not we're going to be these centrist Democrats that are sort right. of essentially weak-leaning Republicans. I would put Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton in that category, and then others who sort of are on the lefter side of the spectrum who say, no, I want a Democrat who really actually, you know, is offensive right. on the offense. On the offense, right. About the types of progressive policies. And we always have to remind people, just because you're a Democrat does not mean you're progressive, right? And I think that goes with the black American community, but that goes with the Democratic Party as a whole. Progressive does not equal Democrat, and I think that that's the real tension that we've had. And so the Republicans, even though they've got their own factions and incredible diversity within their party, the main goal for so many of them, whether it's the local, state, or national level, when it's time to vote together. We've only seen this with like the ACA with, right. with Democrats. But when, when Republicans, it's time to vote together, and we saw, fine, the one blip where you know Trump couldn't get this horrible uh, Health care bill passed. <laughs> right. But other than that, they fall in line. They do. And what makes me really worried is that we now have a minority leader in the Senate in New York U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer, where I don't think that he is the right person for the Democrats at this moment in time. I think that he'll make deals with the Republicans. I think that after 30 years of knowing Donald Trump, he still thinks that he can rationalize with him and compromise with him. And I don't think that he's really going to be an offensive player. I but, think he'll just, um, he'll let things happen and then we'll figure it out after. But there are a fair number of people like you bringing an awful lot of pr uh, pressure on Chuck Schumer and, and other other Democrats. And I think that's to, the to only see. way so, that he will. So we'll see how it works out. We'll have a backbone. Uh, we've run out of time. It goes so fast <laughs> <laughs> when you're on. Uh, Christina Greer, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. Donald Trump received a fair amount of bipartisan praise for his decision to launch missile strikes against Syria in response to Bashar al-Assad's murderous use of chemical weapons. We should not allow that episode to distract us from Trump's nonstop assault on our higher values. 
Consider his choice of Mark E. Green for the important post of Secretary of the Army. Green, a former Army flight surgeon, has been openly and unabashedly hostile to the rights of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. In an appearance last year before the Tea Party of Chattanooga, Tennessee, Green, according to the New York Times, said that President Obama's opposition to laws barring transgender people from using the bathrooms of their stated gender was the kind of government interference that armed citizens should protect themselves against. That's right. This proposed army secretary was encouraging American citizens to take up arms in defiance of their president. He told the Tea Party that if you polled the psychiatrists in the army, they would tell you that transgender is a disease. The Times also said Green implied that the notion of gay marriage was as unthinkable 30 years ago as the idea of government-sponsored baby killing is today. That's Donald Trump's choice for United States Army Secretary. Besides being an assault on our higher values, the choice of Green has a certain bitter irony. If he is confirmed by the Senate, he will take over the post of the first openly gay Army Secretary in America's history. That's all for now. See you next time.